In this video we're going to make a grid map to cut our world into various sections. This can then be used for making all kinds of systems like a heat map, pathfinding or defined valid building areas. Hello and welcome, I'm your Code Monkey, and this channel is all about helping you learn how to make your own games with in-depth tutorials made by a professional indie game developer. So if you find the video helpful, consider subscribing. So here we are and this is what we want to make. We have a nice scene here and as you can see our world is split into various squares. Each square is a grid position on our grid map. And when I click on a specific position, you can see that it modified the underlying value on the grid map in that specific position. This is a very simple grid map that you can extend to solve various problems. For example, you could use it to display where the mouse has been. So here is a very simple example of the grid map being used in order to create a heat map. Alternatively, you could use it to display where your player is dying or where he has killed enemies. You could use it as a base for your pathfinding system to define which cells should be walkable and which should not. Or you could use it, for example, on a management game to define which areas you can build. So as you can see, there's a multitude of potential applications for this simple class. For example, in my latest game, Battleground Tycoon, I use grid maps for all sorts of things like for managing the pathfinding of each specific building to managing the tile map for the ground tiles as well as the environment heat map. So as you can see, there's a multitude of potential applications for this simple class. Alright, so this is our goal. Let's get to it. Okay, so here we are in our scene. All we have is a background texture and nothing else. So let's begin by making our grid class. Over here on the scripts, new C Sharp script, let's call it just grid. Okay, open it up. Now in here, this will be a symbol class, so let's get rid of a mono behavior. Instead, let's make a constructor that receives a width and height. Let's also store these as variables. Now let's also create our underlying int array. We're going to make a multi-dimensional array. So we define it as int, then brackets, comma, brackets. This is how we define a multi-dimensional array with two dimensions. All right, so now in here we create it. So we do a new int array. We pass in the width and the height. All right, so this is our very basic class. We construct it with a width and height and we create the underlying array. Now let's set up a script in order to test it. So back in the editor, let's make a new c -sharp script. Let's call this our testing script. Let's make a game object to run it. So a new game object, call it testing and drag the script onto it, okay. Okay, so this script will test our class. So in here, let's make a private void start. And on start, let's create a new grid with a certain width and height. So let's create a grid object equals new grid. And let's pass in a width of 20 and a height of 10. Okay, that should do it. Now on the grid, let's do a debug.log here on the constructor just to make sure that everything is working. So let's do a debug.log of the width and then the height. All right, let's see. And if there it is over here on the console saying 2010. Okay, great. So we have our grid basic setup and the testing script is running. Now let's add some visuals to be able to see our int grid. Let's create some text objects that will display the underlying value for each grid element. So in here, let's do a cycle to go through our entire array. So let's do a simple for, we start off at zero. And now in here, since we have a multi-dimensional array, we need to figure out the size of each dimension. So we can get that by going into the grid array and call get link. And here you can see that we can give an int for the dimension. So in this case, let's cycle through the first dimension. And then inside, we cycle through the second dimension. So this is how you cycle through a multi-dimensional array. All right, so now it's in here that we want to display a certain element. Okay, so here, just to make sure that our cycle is working correctly, let's do a debug.log on the X and then the Y. And just for testing, let's reduce our grid to just four two. All right, so we got four on the width and two on the height. Let's see. And yep, on the console, you can see that we are indeed cycling through our entire array. 
So we go through 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 2, 0, 2, 1, 3, 0, and 3, 1. So we have 4 on the width and 2 on the height. Okay, so far so good. Now in here, let's spawn a text object in order to visualize the underlying value for this grid element. And for that, I'm going to use a function from the utilities. As long as you can download the utilities for free from intcodemonkey.com. So I'm going to be using codemonkey.utils. And in there, in the utils class, I have a create world text function. Here is the function in case you want to build it yourself instead of using the utilities. As you can see, it just creates a game object, positions it on a certain position, creates a game object with the text mesh component, sets all the text mesh values, including the text. So there it is, very simple if you want to do it on your own. But here, let's use the utilities just to be, make things easier. For the text, let's go into the grid array and grab on x, y, so grab the underlying value. And now in here, we need to know where we're going to position our text object. So let's figure out how we're going to define a position for our grid. Now, in order to do that, what we really need is to know how big each cell is. So over here on the constructor, let's receive a width, then a height, and let's also receive a float for the cell size. Let's store it up here. And now with a certain cell size, we can now calculate where each index lands on a world position. So let's make a function to convert an X and Y into a world position. So here we make a private, we're going to return a vector three. Let's call it get world position. And we're going to receive an int for the X and an int for the Y. And now in here, it's extremely simple. We just return a new vector three with our X and Y multiplied by our cell size. And that's it, very simple. So now we can now use this function all the way up here to get the world position passing the X and the Y. All right, this should do it. So we should now be able to see a text object being placed on every grid position. So here on testing, we created 4.2 and let's also pass in the cell size and let's say 10F. All right, so we should be able to see four times two, so eight text objects. Let's see. And yep, there it is. We can now visually see the underlying values of our grid. And all the text objects are correctly located with a cell size of 10. We can verify that by creating a new empty game object, just to see. There it is, so that one is right there, as you can see on 0, 0. Now we move it on the side, and this one is on 10, 0. And this one up here is on 10, 10. Awesome! All right, so now that we can see the underlying values, let's also add a debug to see the size of each grid position. So over here, where we're creating our text objects, let's also do a debug.drawLine. So here we need a start and an endpoint. So for start, let's use get the world position of the current X and Y. For the end, let's get the world position of the X and the Y plus one. So we have our left side vertical line. Now let's also make the horizontal line on the bottom. So instead of going to Y plus one, it's X plus one. All right, so just like this, we should be able to see a vertical line and a horizontal line. Then let's make it with the color dot white. And let's make it last for, let's say, 100 seconds. All right, that should do it. Let's test. All right, here we are, and we actually can't see anything. And the reason for that is because we are using debug.drawLine. So when you use that, you need to go all the way up here in order to enable gizmos. And there you go. When you do that, you can now enable, and we can now see the edges of our quadrants. So just like this, you can see the quadrant starts in here, goes all the way up here. This is one quadrant, another one, another one, and so on. Now, since we're only printing the left and bottom, that means over here on the top and on the right, we don't have anything. So let's add it right at the end. So after we go through our array down here, let's do a horizontal line. So we're going to start off at zero and at the height, and we go towards the width and the height. And then for the vertical line, we start off at width and zero, and we go towards the width and height. All right, let's test. And if there it is, our nice grid is now fully visible. Awesome. However, you can also see one slight issue, which is that our text objects are right at the origin of each cell. It would be much easier to read if it was right in the middle. So let's do that. Over here, when we create our world test, we are getting the world position, and we can simply offset it by half of our cell size. So we do pause a new vector three, 
let's put it cell size on the X, cell size on the Y, and then we multiply it by 0.5F. So this will shift it by half the cell size. Let's see. And there it is. Awesome. So we can now visually see how our world map is split into various grid cells. All right. Awesome. So now that we can see the underlying values and see our grid, let's make some functions to modify it. So first, let's make a very simple function to set a single value. So in here, let's make a public void. Let's call it set value. And we're going to receive an int for the x, an int for the y, and then an int for the target value. And now in here, all we do is go into our grid array and set on position x, y to be our value. However, here is also where we need to ask ourselves, how should our class deal with invalid values? So what should happen, for example, if we get a negative number? There are various ways to solve that, depending on what you're trying to go for. We can either throw an error or correct it to the closest value or just ignore it. Now, throwing an error would potentially break the game, so we should probably not do that. And if we set the closest value, then our grid map would behave very weirdly on the edges. So in our case, the best course of action is to simply ignore invalid values. So in here, before we set our value, let's make sure that x and y are valid. So we test if x is bigger than or equal to zero. Also make sure the y is also bigger than or equal to zero. And then let's make sure the x is under the width and the y is under our height. With all those, then we have our valid values. And if we receive invalid x and y, we simply ignore it. All right, so far so good. Now, in order to visually see setting the value, we need to update our world text objects, because in here we are simply creating them on the grid on the constructor and we're not updating it. So if we use this, this will not update. So let's deal with that. Let's make a second array just for debug purposes in order to store our debug text objects. So in here, a private, we're going to use a same multidimensional array, but in this case of type text mesh. We created just our, like our underlying array. And here, when we are creating our debug text objects, let's set it on the x, y to be that. All right, so we now have a reference to our debug text objects. Again, these are meant only for debug. So when you go down here and we set the value, let's also update our text object. So we go into the x and y. And we set the text mesh dot text to be on the newly set value. All right, that should do it. Over here on the constructor, let's test. So let's call set value. And let's try putting the value on the x of two, y of one. Let's try putting it to something like 56. All right, so let's see. And if there it is, that one no longer has zero, but rather our newly set value. Awesome. Okay, so now let's make a version of our function to set the value, but instead of taking an x and y, we're going to receive a world position. So let's make a public void. Let's call it set value, just the same, except in here we'll receive a vector three for the world position and an int for our value. And now before we made a version to make the get the world position based on a certain x and y, and now we need the opposite. We need a function to get the x and y when given a certain vector three for the world position. Now in this function, we need to return both the x and the y values. However, functions usually can only return a single value. So we could modify all of our code to work with a struct that owns both the x and y values, or we can simply add out parameters into this function. So in here, let's make this return void, and instead, let's add an out for an int for our x and out int for our y. This way we can return multiple values from a single function. But again, if you wanted, there are many approaches. You could, for example, just make it return a vector to int, and that would work the same. But let's go with the outs for now. So in here, in order to get our x, all we're going to do is go into the mathf and do a floor to int. And we're going to floor our world position dot x divided by our cell size. So with a cell size of 10, the world position 5 will be on grid 0, and a world position of 15 will be on grid 1. So that's how we calculate it, the x and the exact same thing for the y, and that's our calculation. 
All right, so we now have a function to convert our world position into a grid position. And we also have the previous one to convert grid into world. Awesome. So now down here, we can simply use that function. So first we define our x and y. Then we call get x, y. We pass in the world position. And we give an out for the x and an out for the y. And then we simply call set value with our convergent x, y, and pass in the value. And that's it. All right, so now let's go into our testing class. And in here, let's test setting a value on our mouse click. So let's do a private void update. And in here, let's test for an input in order to get the mouse button down. Let's test on the left mouse button, so index zero. Now when we click, let's set the value on the grid. So in order to get the world position, again, we can use the code monkey.utils. In order to get the mouse world position. Again, here is the function in case you want to build yourself. We just go into the world camera and call screen to world point on the screen position. So that's how we get the mouse world position. And now in here, we can now go into our grid. So let's store a reference to the grid, our grid, we construct it on start, and then here we call grid.setValue, pass in the mouse worm position, and then let's pass in a value. All right, so let's see if we can modify our grid by simply clicking on it. All right, so here we are. Now, first of all, let's click outside, and yep, there you go, clicking outside does absolutely nothing since we decided to ignore invalid values. However, now if I go in here and I click, Yep, there you go, we updated our grid value. So we can now easily modify our grid by simply clicking on the desired element. All right, awesome. We have all of our code working perfectly. Now that we can set a value, let's also make a function to get a value. So over here on our grid, we have our two set value functions. Let's make the equivalent in order to get a value. So we're going to make a public, we're going to return an int, call it get value. And we receive an int for the x, int for the y. And in here, we validate the value the same way. And if it's a valid value, we return from the grid array x, y. And if not, then we have an invalid value. So in here, it's up to you. We could, for example, return minus 1, or in this case, just return 0. How you deal with invalid values is up to you. Let's make the same thing for the world position version. All right, we have our two very nice functions. Now let's test them. So in here, let's read the value on the right mouse button. So in here, just doing a debug.log, getting the value on the mouse world position. All right, let's test. Okay, here we are, and I right-click outside, and it always prints zero. There it is. And now I right-click in here, it says zero. Left-click, and I've set it to 56. Right-click, and there you go. It is now correctly reading. So that one reads zero, that one reads 56. Awesome. So you can now set and get values from our grid. All right, now something else very useful is to have a variable origin. Up until now, our grid does all the calculations, assuming the origin is on zero, zero. But sometimes you want your grid to start at a different point. For example, in Battleground Tycoon, I have a grid created for each building, and each building is located on a different position. So in here, let's go into our constructor, let's receive all of this, and then let's also receive a vector3 for the origin position. All right, we have our origin, and now down here, whenever we are doing our calculations, in order to get the wrong position or get the x, y, when converting a grid position into world position, we do this, and then we simply add our origin, and the reverse, getting the world from the x, y, we simply have our world position, then we subtract our origin position, and then we get the x and the y. All right, that should do it. Let's test it out. So here on testing, let's set our origin. Instead of being on 0, 0, let's put it to the right. So let's say on 20, 0. Okay, let's see. 
So here we are and we can pause the game and look at it. Let's create an empty game object just to see where it is located. And there you go, 0, 0 is in here. And over here on the right, as you can see, the origin is on 20, 0. And let's see if the clicking still works. So click out here, nothing happens. Click over here and yep, nothing is set. And when I click in there, there you go, it's set that one, that one, that one. And read also works, awesome. All right, so that's pretty much our basic grid class done. We could also make as many grids as we want with whatever size we want. So let's try making a grid with five. Let's put it under. And let's put another one with 20. All right, so here we have a whole bunch of different grids. Each of them has a different cell size, different width, different height, and they all work the same underneath. So you can see how this class, this code is extremely adaptable to whatever needs you have. So again, using this base, there's a ton of stuff that you can do with it. Now in here, I will quickly show several potential uses for this grid map. I'm going to make a simple heat map to show where the mouse has been. I plan to do a completely detailed video on a heat map, but right now I just want to show what can be done using this as a base. Alright, so here we are with a nice simple heat map. This was made to show where the mouse has been, so whenever I pass over the mouse, there you go, as you can see, the mouse leaves a trail wherever it goes. You can see a heat map with the color, so if I leave it there, it goes from red to yellow to green, and it shows how long the mouse has been on a certain position. So there you go, this is a very simple use case of the underlying grid. So all it's really doing is increasing the value on the underlying grid position under the mouse and converting that value into a nice column. In order to make that work, I just added a few things over here to the grid, like for example, this event. This gets fired whenever the grid value changed. So down here, when we have the set value, we fire off this event. And then over here on the testing class, I created the heat map visual. As you can see, it receives a grid. Then it updates when the grid value changes and the update simply creates the mesh. If you'd like to know how a mesh is created through code, check out the recent video I did on creating a dynamic mesh. So here then just gets the grid value and sets the UV in order to change color of that quadrant. And here it is the texture that I'm using. As you can see, it just has one pixel in black, then it goes red, yellow, green. Again, I plan on doing a complete video detailing the creation of a heat map, but right now I just wanted to show one possible use case for this very simple underlying grid class. I'm also planning another video on how to extend this class to use generics so you can expand it even further. So stay tuned for all of that. As always, you can download the project files and utilities from unitycodemonkey.com. If you liked the video, subscribe to the channel for more Unity tutorials. Post any questions you have in the comments and I'll do my best to answer them. Alright, see you next time.